Hey, good evening. Tonight's Bible study comes from Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, and it reads as follows. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom groom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Amen. Now, as you see here, they said, Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. First and foremost, you should have known that disciples and Pharisees don't go together. But when you look at this, you can see that they were trying to cause dissension between the disciples of John and the Lord. The Pharisees are always up to bad things. They were up to their old tricks. And what they were trying to do was cause trouble for Jesus. Um, what they were trying to do is get some distance between the disciples of John the Baptist, whose disciples were fasting, and those of Jesus, Jesus' disciples, who were not fasting. Thy disciples fast not, he said. And this was equivalent to saying, y'all ain't doing the right thing. And John the Baptist and disciples and the Pharisees are fasting. So the question was, why aren't you? But the Lord objected to this. He he got them back and he put them in check because the first thing he did was he gave them parables. And he gave them three short, heavy parables. The first one talked about the new cloth and on the old garment. The second one was the new wine skins for new wine. And the third, drinkers of old wine care not for the new wine. And if you really want to see all of that, you can see it in Luke 5, 33 through 39, I think it is. Um, but then, as you watch it, Jesus has said unto them, Can the sons of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. And this was a heavy reply. This was a serious punch in your face. Because John the Baptist, remember, had identified who Jesus Christ was as the bridegroom. You remember back in um, John 3 and 29, he told him who it was. And this was appropriately used here as an appeal to John's disciples to make them alert of who he is. The Pharisees had relaxed rules about their fasting anyway on the occasions of their attending weddings um, and with these so-called weddings to attend the Pharisees found little need to do any fasting because that's not what you do at a, wed at a wedding and despite the fact that they were always preaching it but they weren't doing it that's what made them such hypocrites and if you think about it Jesus said, look, look, you, I want to say idiots, but look, you Pharisees, this is a wedding. And the bridegroom, John the Baptist, as I said, already told him who it was. He had said that the bride is the bridegroom, John 3, 29. And we can conclude that the church is the bride with the existence when John spoke, the bride of who? Of God, of Christ. They are one. And the true, actual, true and spiritual Israel is the bride. And John spoke of this genuine Israel. This was not a secret. And that it was being separated through the preaching from the secular Israel. And then it was commingled. But the spiritual Israel which was the church, would in time include the church, John had directed, John, remember, John had directed them 
to follow Christ. Go to Jesus. And hence, that's where you get the statement that he had the bride. And then he, he goes on to say, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. This is just a definite statement of the fact that Jesus will suffer, we know that, and there will be a death. And we all know that. He was telling us that. We knew this. And Jesus states it. And he puts it in this way when he says, But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and they will fast in that day. Well, but the days will come, were coming, and when the bridegroom shall be taken away, didn't just mean his death, but it mean, meant the suffering that he would face at the hands of, before the crucifixion. Now, it is true that the word suffering is not here in this verse. It's not. But death and suffering in this go together. He will be taken away. If you look at Jesus' death, if you look at what led up to his crucifixion, it was how he died. The suffering that he went through. The nails in his hands and feet the crown that he wore, the cat's tail that they hit him with. So, if the removal of the bridegroom from the bride by force, which we were going to do, the bridegroom wouldn't not go away. He shall be taken away. So, it has to refer to Jesus' death. And then they will fast in that day. Mm, mm, mm. This is a reference to the sorrow of which fasting was a sign. Remember, fasting was to get you closer to God, to get your heart right. And if you, and we'll go into some of what fasting says in some of the verses, but it was a sorrow. And it would come upon his apostles during his passion. And then you'll also see it when he's in the tomb. But Jesus wasn't in the tomb long, long. Thank the Lord that he was not in the tomb long, and his word was true, and it was being fulfilled. No man soweth a piece of undressed dress cloth on an old garment, else that which should fill up taketh from it. The new from the old, and a worse rent is made. You remember patching old clothes? That was a familiar thing to us. You know, we used to have them jeans with all the patches in them. But you know, if you had a hole and you put a new piece of patching on it, it would stretch and it would tear. But the truth of it was we were poor. We didn't have the money at times to buy this. Well, this was a familiar thing to Jesus because his poverty was what had made us rich. Jesus was poor. His poverty made us if Jesus would have came down here in wealth, we wouldn't have learned about suffering or humility or being humble or loving because we would have had everything. And the force of this humble metaphor lies in the fact that if a piece of new untrunk cloth is used to bend this hole in an old garment, then just as soon as the garment is washed, it's going to fall apart. It will shrink. And then it will tear and we didn't want this. The application of this means that Christ did not come to somewhat patch up Judaism, which he didn't. With the teaching of Christianity, his holy job was not designed to mend old religions, but was brand new. The gospel was the new word. What Jesus was doing was a new thing that they had never heard, never seen. So Jesus was new to this, a new thing for us, a new thing for the faith. And he came to build it. Remember, Jesus came with the good news. Remember, they said they had never heard such speakings with authority. They had never seen the things that he had done. So... You go down and it says, And no man put of new wine into old wine skins, else the wine will burst the skins, and the wine perisheth, 
and the skins, but they put new wine into fresh wine skins. Remember, skins of animals were used in that time to contain liquids. In this case, excuse me, it was wine. And the thing was, if new wine was put in the old skins, which are getting brittle and hard and everything, because you know, as they fill it up, it soaks up some of it, it dries up, it gets harder, and it keeps going, then it cracks. And it's no longer has the ability to be um, uh, elastic or stretch. And that fermentation process would burst them, and then you would lose the wine. And the wine skins would be useless. And you'd lose the wine skins because they were burst. And this meant that Jesus' new teaching could not be put into John's disciples. But it seems preferable to make the formal, the forms, the ceremonies, and the ordinance of Judaism to be of the old wineskins. Of the old wineskins. Now, Jesus is the new wine, so I got to put this new wine in new people. And Jesus' new teaching could not be synchronized with such things as Jewish fast or man's things. Because these were spiritual things. This wasn't just man's ways. It was the Lord's ways. And to understand this to mean that Jesus would not put his new teaching into John's disciples violates the fact that some of John's disciples became they became apostles of Christ. And you can see that in John 1 and 35. But they had to change. They had to change. However, the majority, the majority of them seemed not to do so. But John had already told him who he was. So, and just for the simple fact that they didn't change, makes you think of this third phase of this reply, and this third reply, no man having drunk old wine, the disciples, desire new wine. For he saith, the old is good. The old is good. Jesus was the new wine, and they were not accepting it. They were still dealing with the old stuff and this Jewish custom of fasting and these Pharisees who were trying to break things apart, but they were not. And I repeat, as I said earlier, when the Pharisees were involved, you should have known there was trouble because they were always going against Jesus. Jesus was this new wine. These men, if they were going to be new wine skin. They had to be changed and accept the new wine that was Jesus. And when he was trying to pour it into them, some of them didn't take it. And John's disciples, a lot of them didn't take it. But John told them who, they, who he was and what he was about. And this fasting that we do and that we, we say that they were saying here, even the Pharisees, with this hypocritical fasting that they said they were doing, it was not true fasting. It was man's way of trying once again to get over on Jesus, as they always did. But as I said, Jesus hit him with three serious, short, and brief parables that were huge. And then he, he, he messed them up. And if you read it one more time, it says, No one sews a patch of untrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Jesus ain't going to pour the new word in the old believers. Because you got to believe in him. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins because they can't take it. And both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. That word will go away from you. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Now, if you want to look up fasting, there are a ton of verses on fasting. Although this brief part of the Bible was speaking on fasting, look up fasting, but there's a lot of Bible verses on fasting. And remember that the fasting was to bring you closer to God, to let you get closer to the Lord, 
And if you just look at Acts 13 and 2, it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Remember, they all were working together. They were all working together. And if you look at 2 Samuel 1 and 12, which we read a few weeks back, they mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and for the nation of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Fasting was to bring you closer to God to recognize who really gives you the strength to let you hear what he is saying, to clean, clear your mind and your spirit so you can hear the Lord and do his will, which sometimes doesn't go with your will. Amen.